My name is Steve, and that is Lake Erie. It is a beautiful place to be for the months of June, July, and August. But for the rest of the year, it can cause quite a lot of problems for the residents living near its shores. Now you're probably wondering, Steve, it's August. We're in the middle of a historic drought. The entire west is on fire. Why are you talking about lake effect snow? And the answer? I think a lot of people forget what a menace to society Lake Erie can be, and all the Great Lakes for that matter, in the wintertime. So, I just kind of want to remind you while the heat is still going on. And if for some reason you're not from the Great Lakes area, you're in for a pretty rude awakening. I'm going to very quickly explain the basics of lake effect snow. In fact, this is the state of Ohio. It's where I currently live. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. This here is Lake Erie. It's the lake that borders Ohio to the north. This right here, this is a cold front. There's cold air coming down from Canada right behind this blue line. When this cold air swings down from Canada, it picks up moisture and warmth from the lake, that all rises and condenses, and it drops as a ton of snow on the southern side of the shore. Now that we know the basics, let's talk about the recipe for the perfect lake effect storm. The biggest factor in any lake effect snow event is quite obviously the lake itself. It has to be one that is not completely frozen over so that the moisture can evaporate into the air when the cold air passes over it. And that's the reason why most of the lake effect snow tends to happen between late November and early February. Most years, Lake Erie is at least 75% frozen over by late February, so you typically don't get lake effect snow after that. But between November and February, why is the lake even warm to begin with? Fundamentally, water takes a much longer time to change in temperature than other materials like dirt or air or steel. This property of matter is called the specific heat of a material. So if it's midsummer and it's been about 80 degrees for a couple weeks, the water temperature might be 75, but then all of a sudden if a cold front comes careening through and the air temperature drops down to around 60, that water temperature is still going to be around 75 because it takes a lot longer time to change in temperature. This is the same thing for the entirety of winter. The air itself might be below freezing, but most of that water is still above 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Let's look at a quick mathematical example using the formula for change in temperature provided by thermodynamics. If the sun transfers 10,000 joules of energy to a 77 degree Fahrenheit kilogram of water in same temperature kilogram of air, using both their specific heats in the equation, the air will be 94.93 degrees Fahrenheit and the water will be 81.3 degrees Fahrenheit. The water is still cooler than the air, even though they received the exact same amount of energy. So naturally, when this warmer water evaporates into cold air, it will then transfer that heat into the air, making it less dense, allowing the air to rise. And when the air rises, that water vapor then condenses, which leads to clouds and eventually rain and snow. But as much as having a warm lake is important to lake effect snow, the amount of lake is also important. Fetch is defined as the length along the lake that cold air can travel before it hits the shore. Quick geometry lesson. Most shapes both have a major axis and a minor axis. The major axis is the length along the longest diameter of that object, and likewise the minor axis is the length along the shortest diameter of that object. Maximizing fetch means that the mean wind blows parallel to the major axis of the lake, giving it the longest amount of time to absorb the most amount of moisture. In the wintertime here in Cleveland, most of our cold air comes from Canada, which is due north of us. And if you look at the layout of the lake, the major axis runs from west-northwest to east-northeast. So it's kind of hard to maximize fetch for Lake Erie specifically. Some of the Great Lakes are pretty weirdly shaped. Have you seen Lake Huron? What is that? Anyway, Lake Huron and Michigan have a north-south major axis, and Superior, for the most part, Erie and Ontario have mainly an east-west major axis. 
So at any given time, if the wind is blowing from the west or the north, you're still gonna get some type of maximization of fetch somewhere in the Great Lakes at any given time. And you're probably wondering, can the fetch of one lake affect the fetch of another lake downwind? The answer is absolutely yes, it happens all the time. Since Lake Huron is located to the north of Lake Erie, you'll get lake effect snow that's happening south of Lake Huron that then drifts over Lake Erie, gets re-intensified by the moisture from Lake Erie, and drops in northern Ohio. Now let's talk about friction, specifically the interaction between land and the air itself. The actual shape of the shoreline greatly influences not only where the snow falls, but how much. Winds tend to converge or flow together in concave type shorelines like bays. Winds tend to diverge or flow away from convex shorelines, such as a peninsula. When winds converge, they are more likely to form single snow bands, which are a lot more intense. They can produce more snow. They can also produce thunder and lightning. In the Great Lakes, these concave shorelines tend to line up with the major axes of the lakes. Friction doesn't just work on the horizontal shoreline, though. It also works in the vertical. Higher elevations near shorelines physically force the air upwards, which causes it to condense faster and produce more precipitation. So what happens if all these features sort of come together? Well, there's one place in the United States that's relatively high in elevation. It is on a concave shoreline, and it is also along the major axis of a lake that tends to get its fetch maximized. That place is the Tug Hill Plateau east of Lake Ontario. It's known for some of the most outrageous record-setting lake effect snowfall events in history, and you can expect about 200 inches a year of snowfall. That wind shear is what fuels severe thunderstorms. If you can get a thunderstorm to develop vertically into wind shear, you have some problems. Wind shear just means the changing of direction or speed of wind with height. 30,000 feet above my head right now, the jet stream's probably blowing at about 80 miles an hour, but I'm looking outside and the winds are completely calm. That means that there is wind shear in that portion of the atmosphere. Wind shear is a very good indicator of what type of lake effect snow bands will occur. I'm gonna refer to the height of the atmosphere in millibars. If you don't know what that means, go ahead and click this video up here. I explain how meteorologists map the atmosphere in terms of pressure rather than height. It's just, it's easier on so many levels. When the winds turn less than 30 degrees between the surface and 700 millibars, you can expect very intense single bands of lake effect snow. When the winds turn between 30 and 60 degrees between the surface and 700 millibars, you can expect multiple bands of lake effect snow that are kind of shallow. They don't produce a ton of snow, but they produce it over a wider area than just a single band. And if you somehow have wind shear over 60 degrees between the surface and 700 millibars, the wind is just gonna be mixing everything so much that the, there's not gonna be a lot of condensation. There's not gonna be any precipitation that forms. It'll just mainly be cloudy with a few flurries at best. We have nitpicked the tiny factors that make up this big picture. Let's talk about the big picture now. What causes all of these factors to even line up in the first place? How did we determine all of this? This is a mid-latitude cyclone, AKA an area of low pressure that typically swings through the Great Lakes region in the winter time. The structure is pretty simple. There's a warm front boundary right here. Warm air is racing up towards the north on the southeast side. And on the northwest side, you have cold air diving down. And then there's the frontal boundary right there. You can see, got a counterclockwise spin that is very important. That is the only reason why this works. In order for the system to maximize fetch for everyone, which is really rare, but it can happen, uh, the cold air has to swing down north to south over Michigan and here on Superior, you kind of you kind of get left out. I'm sorry. You're, it's the biggest lake. You're going to get lake effect snow no matter what, even if fetch isn't maximized. And then after that, the winds have to turn out of the west over, what is that, Erie and Ontario, so that it can go over the major axes of those two lakes. Like I said, that's very rare. The big picture setup is that the center of the low passes the Great Lakes to the east, so that the cold air on the northwest side can flow over top. This can happen maybe several times a year. Last year, it happened twice. It happened once on December 1st, and then again on Christmas, and the result, was fantastic. I was like, oh, it's fine. I don't need to bring my boots home for Christmas break and uh, really starting to regret that now.
It's your lake. It's what you get. It's all the lake's fault. I hope you guys enjoyed learning about lake effect snow. I studied it a lot in college, and I felt like I owed the rest of the world an explanation. Uh, don't come here in the winter. <laughs> don't. I, I don't know if I have to say that, but it's not. If, if you want to come to any Great Lakes town or city for a vacation, summer, period. <laughs> This video is being entered into a contest that was started by 3Blue1Brown just to get people to make more math explainer videos. I think that trying to get people to make more educational content is such a great cause and I'm very happy that I got to enter this contest. Subscribe to Weatherbox if you haven't already. I'm going to keep making educational content on meteorology and uh, hopefully some people stick around for the ride. See you next week. People keep asking if I'm going to repaint my wall. I'm doing it right now.